Wednesday's high is looking like it may have marked a blow-off top for this recent rally, especially over on the NASDAQ side of the market. We'll check out all of the relevant data points and ensure that we come back from this shortened holiday trading week with a logical game plan. I truly do hope that you and yours had a wonderful Thanksgiving, but it's time to get back to work. As always, check out the links listed down below in the description, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe if you've not already done so, and stay tuned until the end of today's show. I've got two additional trade ideas to share with you that you don't want to miss. With that said, let's jump right into the charts. So kicking things off on the SPY weekly time frame, talking about candle structure and location as we always do. In terms of structure, solid green bodied bar with very minimal upper wick, certainly nothing to read into from a psychological point of view, and thus a strong close near the highs of the weekly range. Buyers are in control there. If we think about location on the bar to bar count, a substantial higher low as well as a higher high. Buyers go two for two on the weekly count that will change over on the NASDAQ side of things. If we're looking at momentum, it's worth reminding ourselves that it's been a near vertical move in the upward direction with zero hesitation from the buyers at the prior pivot here and zero hesitation even on the shortened holiday trading week at the prior pivot over here. We technically opened underneath. We did come up slightly shy though of the summertime high, which is technically at 459. So if we do see continuation, a good first target is 459. And then we have to have that awkward conversation about, hey, all time highs are on the table up here close to 480. There's not much stopping us in between a break of the summer highs up to the all time high. It'd be slightly irresponsible to not point out 470. We'll also see a high volume node there, but it was the prior flat top. And you can also see a little bit of rejection in the upper wick of the green inverted hammer. So those are your upper reach targets. And once again, there's nothing inherently bearish about the weekly chart currently, but the million dollar question is we haven't seen a higher low pullback. So if we do see a higher low pullback, where do we want to be looking for potential support? Let's take a closer look. It's going to be the same two levels that we were really talking about last week as well. The line in the sand is down here. This was the neckline of your weekly double top. There's touch one, touch two. That, of course, is the neckline. A break of it really kicked off the weekly downtrend. And we also have some price history there with the weekly lower high. So a pullback to that zone makes sense from a structural point of view. But we also know that there's lots of confluence if we bring out something like the anchored view apps. If we anchor to the high of the summertime move and also the AI mania breakout, as well as the October low, that'll slowly creep up here. You're getting big confluence at this as a structural level, anchored view apps, and then we can also throw on the Fibonacci from the October low up to the most recent high. If we do get continuation to the summer highs first, just understand that your 38.2 will migrate slowly in the upward direction. But that zone is incredibly important, right? Because as we know, any pullback that holds a 38.2 technically classifies this as healthy bull flag consolidation. Then we're looking for trend continuation if there is a break of those summer highs up to the all time high that we were just discussing. So this is a pretty important line in the sand on the weekly chart, but there's actually another pullback level right here at the lower bound of the double inside bar range that is going to offer a potential higher low above that line in the sand. That area is also confluence with your daily CPI gap fill reversal, right? That's 441. So if we throw on a volume profile, what you'll notice here is it's also the highest volume node. It's the point of control, as we call it. Let's go to auto zoom there. This is kind of funky. Uh, there you are, right? So there is your point of control straight through the lows of the double inside bar range. Technically, the number is 443.41. But again, that's a gap. That's the CPI gap. We'll see it on the daily chart in just a moment. 441 gap fill reversal would be a stronger weekly higher low area for potential support. Last thing to comment on is the high volume node here up around 470. If we break the summer highs, that's the only volume resistance that we have to contend with before that all time high. And once again, any pullbacks that look like this are bullish. Any pullbacks that look like this are also bullish. There's nothing inherently wrong, though, with the weekly structure. There's nothing suggesting that a pullback is the most likely course of action. Let's get granular now on the daily. Let's begin with our expected move. If you're not familiar with this study, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. If we're contained by the upper bound, the number is 460 flat. And that of course would imply a higher high. If we're contained by the lower bound, the number is 450 60. And that would produce a higher low on the daily time frame chart. I'm also thrilled that the lower edge of the expected move is confluence with the breakout point from the three day balance in the past. So expected move is definitively bullish. If we take a look at the trend here, it's clearly in the upward direction. We just produced a brand new higher high in the sequence with Wednesday's breakout, and thus we can afford a higher low pullback. So on the daily chart, we really don't want to see a higher low that's in alignment with a weekly higher low. On the daily chart, you want to stay above the breakout point here, which is the lower edge of the expected move, but technically from a structural point of view, 
451.10. A daily pullback that looks something like this is constructive and then continuation reaches your upper targets for the weekly equal highs, which we just discussed around 459. Technically, the three highs from back here are a little bit south of that at 457.75. If we get a break of the summertime highs, the first structural target to be thinking about is 461.75 that is extended through the upper bound of the expected move. So let's talk about the pattern that's in force here because something's different compared to last time, right? We have gap and go, consolidate, and then squeeze, right? Gap and go, consolidate, and then squeeze. Now, what you'll notice is that Monday certainly completed the pattern with the breakout. Let's get a little bit tighter on that most recent price action. Uh, you can see there's your Monday squeeze. Tuesday's even bullish and healthy because the inside bar technically does not violate that breakdown point. However, instead of consolidating sideways, Wednesday broke to a higher high. And the whole reason that the gap and consolidate and then squeeze was on the table was because we had these very incremental higher highs, or in this case, even just equal highs, lower highs, it was clearly consolidation. What happened on Wednesday was we put in an excess high, and then we actually closed really indecisive. I mean, it's a pure doji. The open and close are one and the same. Friday is a half day, so we're not even going to read into that price action, but it's a really indecisive close. This is not a firm breakout in the upward direction. And we also don't just have this sideways consolidation that might suggest a similar pattern to what we were having in the past. So if this is truly an excess high, and the weak close there is giving us a lack of confidence, what do the bears want to see on the daily? So instead of looking for a higher low at 451.10, and keep in mind, the trend is up. We just produced a higher high. So the first course of action should be looking for a higher low here. If it does not hold, though, the bears would like to see the beginnings of a head and shoulders. Some sort of lower high underneath starts to kick off a daily trend reversal, then a lower high here puts the CPI gap in jeopardy. Underneath 446.15, we close the gap to 441, and that's your weekly higher low. On the daily chart, when and if we trade down to this level, I would be thinking about the possibility for a weekly higher low. Can we find a daily trend reversal pattern? Something like a double bottom, something like an inverted head and shoulders, or just a very simple daily hammer candle. All of those things would be valid here at 441. So we know our ups from downs. The last bit of confluence that will show is the anchored VWAP spread from the most recent move lower, though. We're not going to go back to the October lows of uh, not here, but a year ago now. Um, and what you'll notice is that the quote average short position is still underwater. So even if we do start this pullback, you're still looking at big confluence with that 437.35 level we were still discussing on the weekly chart. So just pointing out that the shorts are still, there's still an opportunity to squeeze more shorts out, right? If the quote average short position is still being held from this as a collective location. So it's not that we're bearish. It's not that we're hoping for a big market breakdown, but there's a strong case to be made that on a weekly pullback, these levels are very, very important to the downside. And we understand the path and how to achieve them ultimately on the daily time frame chart. You get your daily head and shoulders. Keep in mind, this would suggest an extension through the lower edge of this week's expected move. So it might not happen this week, but it's one possible path to to move forward. Let's take a look now at the hourly. Clearly, there's an uptrend in place with consecutive higher lows here and higher lows here on the Wednesday session as well. And of course, complemented by higher highs, the highest high being produced on Wednesday's morning breakout. Now, there are two very particular places where the sellers could have gained control on Wednesday's session. Keep in mind, it was a gap and go. So it was a gap and go originally, and then we rotated downwards quite aggressively, and the buyers stepped in for a perfect gap fill reversal. And then in the afternoon, there was also a liquidation break. So in in both of those instances, there's really an opportunity for the sellers to take advantage of momentum. And what you'll notice is that they could not even penetrate into the Tuesday inside bar range. And for the most part, a lot of the price acceptance was near the highs of the Monday breakout. So that really strikes me as a failure from the sellers and just sort of, you know, neutral from the buyers, right? It's not like we saw a strong trend continuation. You could read into the same exact thing in the upper wick of the Wednesday session and say, hey, the buyers didn't really control the move in the upward direction. You can see the lack of confidence into the end of day. And you're absolutely right with that. Uh, but obviously being in an uptrend, you have to give the buyers the benefit of the doubt. So what else can we see here? Let's take a look at the anchored view apps intraday and just point out that you are getting strong confluence from an intraday perspective around this 451.10. So on the daily chart, although we were talking a lot about the possibility of the daily head and shoulders, something that looks like this, there's still a strong case to be made. And it's still the primary case to be made that 451.10 is a strong level of support. So going forward into this coming weeks worth of trade, how do we actually want to navigate the chart in front of us? Obviously, the buyers just want to see this flat anchored view app resolve in the upward direction with a break in price acceptance over 455.50. If that's the case, we're looking for our daily levels off 
to the left from the summertime high, 457, 75, 459. Anything beyond that is the upper edge of the expected move at 460. The ideal pullback is just continued consolidation in this range here, then looking for continuation into the later stages of this week. That would be holding 453.25. If you're a bear and you're looking for the stronger reversal, a good first step is a lower high underneath here, but keep in mind your daily higher low can be found at 451.10. So this might be a scalp in the downward direction, but you're not overstaying your welcome, at least on the first test, at 451.10. The stronger case to be made for bears is price acceptance down here, flipping into a firm hourly downtrend with highs, lower highs, lows, and lower lows, and then breaking into this range starts to cement the daily head and shoulders we were discussing, and then, of course, we can start thinking about the CPI gap underneath us. You will have to contend with 448.10. That will be a major inflection point considering how it was defended on the second test over in this area. With all of that said, we know our ups from downs. Let's take a look at some supporting evidence. Market internals are always exhibit A. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. I would say that the buyers are largely in control here, but let's walk specifically through Tuesday and Wednesday's session. Tuesday is the day where we put in the inside bar inside of the Monday breakout. And what you'll notice out of the internals is that there was technically a bearish edge on the Tuesday session. But what did price actually do? Look at the bullish consolidation into the afternoon after holding. If I just scrunch this out, we know that this gray zone represents the breakout point in the first place. There it is on Monday, right? So if there was ever a time for the sellers to take control of the market and offer a trend reversal, it could have been here with the lack of hold on this level. And once again, the internals technically were more bearish than bullish. So the sellers kind of failed that opportunity on Tuesday. But if we fast forward a little bit to Wednesday's session. This is really where the excess high, maybe blow off top theory comes into play. There's your blow off top. There's the excess and there's the momentum in the downward direction. What were the internals like on Wednesday's session? Bullish from a volume flow perspective, bullish in the advanced decliner, and even bullish in the morning session, albeit very mild, bullish in the morning session out of the cumulative build. So the sellers kind of failed to really gain much momentum across the broad market as that pullback was unfolding. So sure, maybe this turns into a blow off top. Maybe it's an excess high, but nothing about the internals really support that idea just yet. Even here with the liquidation break into the afternoon, this is like everybody wants to close out. Nobody wants to hold over the Thursday chop session, the holiday, uh, you know, and then the shortened Friday session. That's everybody liquidating. Where do we find buyers? Right at the lows of the day's session. And the internals remain largely positive into the close. There's your Wednesday breath. Here's your Wednesday advanced decliner. The only thing that dipped a little bit negative was the cumulative build. So I'm not seeing a stronger case that the sellers are really dominating this market. Sure, if this is going to turn into a blow off top, I would wait patiently for an hourly trend change or on the spy daily, the loss of 451.10. But as of right now, buyers in control until proven otherwise. Market profile is always exhibit B. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. Let's take a look at what's happening here with value area and point of control. Here's the Monday trend session and the point of control is fairly weak actually in the overall distribution of that profile. But because it's so thin, it's really not all that surprising. Tuesday's inside bar technically does produce a migration higher for the point of control, but we really care about what happened on the Wednesday session. Notice that your value area and point of control were centered in the individual range, but they were breakaway to the upside from the Monday and Tuesday session. And what that does technically is produces overhead supply if we can break down through the low of the Wednesday session. Notice that you have a poor low down here, very close to the gap fill reversal. So that would also indicate a mechanical low, uh, just meaning that we very likely have stop losses that are stacked underneath that. If we can take out Wednesday's low of day from a market pro profile point of view, you turn this into overhead supply and very likely go on a stop run to kick off a little bit of an hourly downtrend. That's if we're looking for a reversal. If you're looking to play this in the upward direction, I mean, it's quite clear based on the Wednesday excess high, there's your A period. So if we're going to use the term blow off top, right, you're basically looking for a failure underneath Wednesday's low. If you're going to use this spike, though, it's not technically a spike because it happens in the morning. Uh, but if you're going to use the single prints, the A period uh, sort of run, if you will, if you're going to use that to inform some trade decisions, it's also a very clean trade breaking out up and over 4573 just target the high of Wednesday's session closer to 4581 right you can see that there's not a lot of volume commitment up there at those highs so breaking through that you should see a move sooner rather than later so those are the ups and downs but for the most part if you're looking for a bearish reversal based on market profile I would be highly attentive to the poor low from Wednesday's session here changing gears to a QQQ weekly time frame chart what do we see here from a candle structure and location point of view and you can start to see how the buyers don't don't technically have as strong of a structure with that larger upper wick. They've only closed about midway through the weekly range. Now, let's not get it twisted. We still have a green bodied bar, meaning that the close is, of course, over the opening print. And that, of course, is more bullish than bearish on the location 
front, substantial higher low as well as a higher high. What would have made this bar more bearish, obviously a red close would have been more bearish, but even if we could have just closed inside of the previous weekly range, that also would have been a little bit more bearish. Obviously, that did not happen. You can clearly see here as well that we did break the summertime highs and we technically closed above. So it's not as bad as it could have been, but the upper wick starts to become slightly more concerning from a structural point of view. Very classic setup would be if you can take out the low of an inverted hammer, you start to look for a pullback. So what do we have for pullback levels here on the QQQ? I would be highly attentive to your CPI gap fill reversal, which is at 378.25. It's also prior structure from over here as a weekly pivot. The anchored view apps are not as clean for confluence. They're a little bit lower on the QQQ, much more closely aligned with this area in here, closer to 368. And if we bring out a Fibonacci from the October low to the high of the most recent move, your 38.2 is kind of mixed in between no man's land. It's not quite 378.25 CPI gap fill reversal. It's also not quite this area in here with your anchored view apps. The main illustration is that obviously after breaking to a higher high from this point of view, breaking to multiple higher highs from this point of view, we can of course afford a higher low pullback. So sure, we can talk about blow off top and how maybe this ultimately marks the end of this potential rally here, but it's not enough to really change the weekly sentiment to say, hey, it's time to put your bear hat on and look for the market to make a new lower low. If you think about the overall pattern here, you can start to technically refer to this as a cup and handle breakout now that we've exceeded the very top of the handle. So that, of course, is a bullish pattern. Your next target overhead, once again, it's kind of an awkward conversation to have, but 405 all-time highs are really right around the corner. What do we have from a volume profile point of view? Let's throw that on. What you'll notice is you, just like in the S&Ps, you get a little bit of something here at 400 south of the all-time high from a volume point of view, but uh, really not much going on now that we've broken out over these highs. There's really a low volume void until we hit that as a bit of a shelf. And then, you know, again, it's all time highs, blue sky territories. If we do pull back, we're well above the point of control. And that's really more so confluence with your anchored view apps at this point in time. So the illustration is that sure, structurally, things are different over here in the QQQ with the close in the midpoint of the weekly range. It's not outright bearish though. So sure, we can look for a pullback, but we know where we're looking for higher lows. Ideally, it's the CPI gap fill reversal. Let's take a look on the daily, but 378.25. So your expected move on the Qs is technically different from the s and Obviously, if we're contained by the upper bound, it's 395.15, suggesting a higher high. But look at the lower bound here at 383.25. That is not suggesting a hold of the breakout point from the Monday session for a higher low. It's just suggesting an equal low to the four-day balance, which we broke out of in the first place. And as we know, is the top of the CPI gap. So that's a little bit more nuanced. It's certainly more neutral as opposed to outright bullish. The other thing to point out here is the pattern of the excess high from Wednesday, which then closes as a red bar first and foremost, but certainly inside of the Monday sessions range. And that was not the case over in the S&P. We closed right at the highs of the Monday session as opposed to here, which is clearly underneath. And that's a little bit more of a bearish indication. So once again, if there's signs of a blow off top, it's certainly stronger over here on the NASDAQ side of the market. If there is going to be a continuation of this overall trend, the buyers need to hold your daily higher low over 387.25. So consolidation in here really just builds out a new range, but that upper wick is a bit menacing just illustrating that, hey, we don't really have the opportunity to break out of that and squeeze again. That was what should have happened on the Wednesday follow-up. It did not. So if sellers are hanging out up here at those highs, the bears really just want to see a breakdown on the daily through 387.25 to then contend with ultimately the CPI gap close at 378.25. Now, when and if we get there, because of what we literally just discussed over on the weekly, you're looking at daily reversal patterns down here at 378.25. I would not be overly aggressive on the gap close from CPI. Look for daily reversals there to get there in the first place. Obviously, this kicks off your daily head and shoulders, right? Something that does that. Then your breakdown is through there. So you can take that short, that there's nothing wrong with that, right? You can see the structure and how that could unfold. But when we close the gap, at least be open-minded to the possibility for a reversal. You can see your line in the sand down here at that 373, kind of mixed in there with where your Fibonacci 38.2 would have been, not quite the uh, point of control high volume node, right? Let's move on down and obviously upper targets. If we do continue, you have 397, then there's 402.25. 405 is basically what we're talking about with all-time highs just north of that. That would be extended through the upper bound of the expected move. So dial back the expectations on that one, perhaps. Overall, again, the focus first and foremost should be on this level here from the daily 387.25. Let's go on down to the hourly 
hopefully and see what else we can learn. You can still see your strong rejection of those highs. Basically, the first hour of the session on Wednesday produces the range. Everything else is an inside bar. On Friday, technically, the S&P is inside of Wednesday. On Friday here in the queues, we actually did break down for a very nuanced lower low. It's basically on zero volume, so I wouldn't read into that too, too much. But still, there you go. There is your indication for 387.25. If you're going to maintain an hourly uptrend and go lows, higher lows, you really need to hold that. If you break down through it, you get a lower low. You're looking for a short trade in here and then the CPI gap to close. That's how the bears want to see this unfold. If you're a buyer, if you're a bull saying, no, 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 Matt, market's still got room to run in the upward direction. You need consolidation in here. You cannot afford a lower low underneath 387.25. You're looking for breaks and higher lows to hold over 391.15, which we clearly did not like intraday on that Wednesday session. In terms of supporting evidence over on, let's actually take a look at the anchored view app, see if this is helping out over here uh, intraday out of the NASDAQ. Yeah, what you'll notice is that these can start to act as resistance, whereas in the S&P, we're really just closed right on them, right? So this anchored view app from the Wednesday session might act as, again, a little bit of overhead rejection there. So be open-minded to more so consolidation through here. Bulls need to be patient for that higher low, converting the anchored view app from resistance into new potential support. And again, bears, you're being patient under 387.25. Nice confluence with the anchored view apps here. Let's jump on over to the market internals for the NASDAQ side of things. Similar comments, uh, obviously, on the Tuesday session, there's a little bit deeper of a move on bearish internals, on bearish internals, on bearish internals. And then Wednesday, it's kind of more mild than anything else. Once again, with the indication of momentum in the downward direction here and the liquidation break, I would have expected a little bit more. But the Tuesday session starts to overshadow, especially what was happening on Monday. The internals on the NICE side of things were really strong on Monday, not the case over on the NASDAQ. So again, the NASDAQ cues is really where you want to be looking if you're trying to spot some sort of blow off top or stronger odds for a pullback. If we take a look at the market profile for your NASDAQ, it's the same thing basically, but look at how your value area and point of control are lower in the Wednesday session as opposed to being more central. You can clearly see the A period, uh, you know, single prints. That's going to be up and over 16,100. If we were to break up and over that, that could be a scalp in the upward direction to Wednesday's high, which is closer to your 16,170. If we're going to move in the downward direction, we do not have a poor low from the Wednesday session, but breaking down underneath that, of course, turns this into overhead supply. I would be very mindful of probably losing the Tuesday low of day because that was so closely related to the breakout point of the previous four day balance, right? So underneath Tuesday's low of day probably gets more dangerous for a stronger short to come in, but you can clearly see the indication of an excess high and a whole lack of price acceptance on the highs from the break of Wednesday morning. That's all we've got in the NASDAQ. Let's take a look at the IWM. And last but certainly not least for the broad market is the IWM Russell 2000 and the small caps on a weekly time frame chart. What do we see here from a candle structure and location point of view, certainly throwing a curveball in the mix with a green bodied hammer candle indicating that of course the buyers stepped up towards the lows of the weekly range. They were able to push prices to the opening print and of course through the opening print for a strong close near the highs of the weekly range. So kudos to our buyers. But unfortunately, let's not fool ourselves. This is an absolutely microscopic range on the bar to bar count location wise, we do have a lower high, as well as a substantial higher low. The other thing I like about the low of the IWM weekly bar is that technically it does hold up over the neckline of this as an inverted head and shoulders. Unfortunately, if this is an inverted head and shoulders, then this is certainly a regular head and shoulders. And we're still underneath that neckline, still rejecting near the 50 SMA on the weekly time frame chart. And in the grand scheme of things, I mean, we're only in the midpoint of the weekly range. So to be constructive for the broadening nature of the rally, good first step would be in here, the upper 50%, but more importantly, clearing 200 in the IWM. Nothing about this weekly chart would suggest that that's a high probability outcome into the coming week's worth of trade. One step at a time, we got to start somewhere. And ideally on the weekly chart, we start to hold on to the low of last week or just the uh, sort of neckline of this pattern here at 174.75. In terms of our Fibonacci's and anchored view apps, let's start with the anchored view apps. What you'll notice is that we're underneath a bulk of them, but the high, so anchored from up here, did act as support in last week's worth of trade. That's constructive, but we've still got to get out of this little pinch in here. Remember that your 50 SMA is over here as well. We've really got to clear uh, this area in the upward direction. We're talking about 180. Getting north of 180 with price acceptance is a good start on the weekly time frame chart, but let's you know not call it anything more than what it is. Ultimately, coming in from the all-time high to the most recent lows down here, we're still underneath our 38.2. It's very difficult to say that 
that this is a constructive look once again if we're still trading in this as an overall range. From a volume profile perspective, any big recaptures in here? Uh, yeah, we're back over that neckline. So once again, this push in the upward direction, it's a good first step. But ideally, we've got to get out of this uh, if we're going to, again, speak to IWM helping and supporting the broadening nature of the market rally. Let's jump on down to a daily time frame chart here and see what else we can learn about our IWM levels. Here we go. And let's take a closer look. So once again, really a compressed range, just balance going sideways, not doing anything constructive, really. The one thing I will say, though, is because of this CPI gap thin structure underneath us, you know, you have to give a little bit of credit to the buyers, right? There was technically a little range that had developed. We broke down on that Tuesday session. There was no follow through to even retest this area here around 175.25. The top of the gap is technically at 174.20. We know that the weekly inverted head and shoulders we were just describing, that kind of neckline is through that zone in here. So with the fake breakdown on Tuesday, I would be inclined to say that the consolidation is definitely more bullish than bearish. It's just not, again, in the grand scheme of things, all that helpful uh, for the broad market. Now, don't get it twisted. We do have lows, higher lows, and opportunities for higher lows to continue if we can respect the lower edge of this week's expected move. So even if we do break from this as a four-day balance, looking for support here at 175.25, the lower edge of the expected move, 175.69. If we do break out of the range in the upward direction, firstly having to contend with the 200 SMA here on the daily at 181, then the upper edge of the expected move at 182.90. Uh, 183 is really your next structural element from where this breakdown occurred in the first place. Let's take a look at at the hourly time frame chart here. See what else we can learn about small caps. And again, it's really the same. Uh, you'll notice the breakdown on Tuesday did not materialize. You can see that we stayed consolidating in this range on the Wednesday session. Even on the Friday shortened session, we actually got a strong break in the upward direction, which is quite interesting. A very nuanced level to be paying attention to is right here, technically, at 179. And he opens above 179, that potentially break in the upward direction. Very, very bullish. Obviously, higher lows over 179.50. Trade for this high back here, your daily 200 SMA 181. If we break down, this is a good first step for the bears, but really, I would want to see the con uh, confirmed lower high underneath 177.75 before thinking about the move to the lower edge of the expected move. Also, remember, it's not outright bearish if we go there. You can still get a daily higher low digesting this CPI gap up in the first place. The biggest bearish breakdown is the loss of the inverted head and shoulders neckline. It basically undoes all of the progress that's been made in the upward direction. So this is your key level uh, to the downside at 175.25 and the top of the gap technically at 174.20. Let's move along and take a look at the internals for the Russell. Uh, you know, decent outflows on Tuesday when that breakdown was taking place. So once again, if stronger sellers were going to appear, all the ingredients were technically there on Tuesday. They basically failed with the consolidation resuming into the end of the week. You can see again, here are your Tuesday week internals, Tuesday week internals. On Wednesday, mixed bag. Friday, when we got that push in the upward direction, let's take a closer look here. Uh, you did start to get a strong cumulative tick read out of of the Russell. So interested to see how that continues to unfold into the early stages of this coming week. Overall, I would say that the failure from the sellers is the biggest takeaway from the market internals there. Market profile, last but certainly not least, what do we see going on here with our overall ranges? I mean, it's just a balance. It's a balance until proven otherwise. The most bullish thing that could happen is again, staying over this 1808. That would be the equivalent of the nuance level we just saw on the IWM hourly chart, right? So any consolidation over that, looking for breaks in the upward direction, clearing these two equal highs, that would be over. 18, 15, 50, that would continue a breakout in the upward direction. And as we know, our target would be the highs from over here. You're starting to think about 1835, 1836. Let's take a look behind the curtain at the weekly performance of our S&P sectors. What we'll notice is that everything is green barring energy at the very bottom, only off by 13 basis points. At the top of the list is the XLV healthcare sector, D for defensive, but second heaviest weighted sector by market cap is technically up 2.65%. Underneath it is the XLP. It's not nearly as heavy weight, but it is D for defensive up 1.75%. Then we see communications, materials, financials, the heaviest weight risk on sector, the XLK tech sector is towards the bottom of this list only air quotes up 75 basis points. So the rotation that we're seeing doesn't really strike me as a risk off rotation. It's a catch up rotation, if you will, which keeps the broad market healthy, right? If the broad market can pull back and go sideways as these sectors play catch up, we see the XLK cool off as the XLK potential 
potentially resumes its uptrend, that's what fuels the next move higher out of the S&P and, of course, the QQQ NASDAQ. Let's take a look at the structural charts. And I have the charts way zoomed out to multi-year charts so we can just see that healthcare is not breaking out of a multi-month slash year range, right? It's just coming off the lows of this range, which is not a leadership quality, right? It's just basically playing ping pong in this big balance. So because it's the second heaviest weighted sector, just treat it for what it is. Face value, upward pressure is upward pressure. I like the move over 129, breaking out over this flat top. Any pullbacks just want to find support over 129. If it can play ping pong in this as an overall range, that would be healthy for the broad market. XLP, again, leaving this zoomed out. Does this look like it's exhibiting leadership and trying to push the market to new highs? Absolutely not. If we take a closer zoom over here, we're still underneath the big breakdown from the weekly charts under 71. So sure, upward pressure is upward pressure, but it's not a leadership issue. It's a catch-up rotation, as we'll start referring to it as, right? Here's the XLC. This is a little bit different, right? Because here's your all-time high. This, though, is a very strong uptrend. It's not just stuck in a balance range playing ping pong. It's trying to make a strong recovery effort off of these lows, and it's broken out of a weekly bull flag, monthly bull flag, if you will. This has to strike me as a healthy and bullish breakout, which, as we know, XLC is definitely more of a risk-on indication for the market. So with this break, of course, that's a bullish indication, as we just said, but because we just produced a higher high, anything goes for a higher low, over 69.90, gap fill reversal off of 68.60, even the top of the range at 68.10, you're looking for higher lows, and that would keep the broad market constructive, right? Really nothing wrong with your XLC, bullish help for the S&P. Here's the XLB material sector, again, sideways in a range. It's not really doing anything all that impressive or exhibiting leadership qualities. Sure, it broke out over the neckline of an inverted head and shoulders, upward pressure is upward pressure, but it's such a lightweight sector that it's not really going to make or break anything uh, if it's trying to, quote unquote, exhibit leadership. Here's the XLF. Actually, let's leave this zoomed out. We do want to see a stronger recovery effort out of the XLF. If financials could break up and out of this from like a weekly or monthly balance range perspective, that would feel much more comfortable for your S&P. If we take a closer look, we're getting close, and this certainly is a big help, a big step in the right direction. Remember that we really recaptured this weekly inflection point here, broke out firmly above it. This has to strike me as a risk on indication. Sure, you could get pullbacks, but just like the XLC, after breaking to a higher high, any higher low goes over 35, over this inflection point here at 34.65. Heck, on a weekly or monthly chart, you could still go gap fill reversal, get a weekly higher low there, and then look for a constructive break of that larger balance we were just referring to. So today's sector lineup is really about understanding where we're at in these larger trends. Here's real estate, technically a hard asset, lighter weight sector for the S&P. You could view it as defensive, but again, is it outperforming? Is it doing anything impressive? No, it's just moving back into this area from back over here. Obviously very rate sensitive. It's a bullish indication to see it in the upward direction, but nothing crazy. Let's move along and take a look at utilities. Same song and dance. Overall downtrend. Here is the recapture uh, or sort of recovery, I should say, off of the lows. It has not technically recaptured the big weekly breakdown point, right? So 63, if we take that out, again, it's a helpful force for the broad market. It's not technically exhibiting leadership here uh, or outperforming by any substantial margin. So not seeing issues there. XLI industrials, it would be great if this one could get back up and stay over. It is at this point, right? With this most recent break, we want to see it stay over that gap, right? So anything that's over 103.75 constructive, definitely more of a risk on indication for the broad market. Here's the XLK, the heaviest weight risk on sector, all time highs. Again, how can you say anything bearish about this as a cup and handle breaking to an all-time high. You could talk about concentration risk. You can talk about how it's the Magnificent Seven. doesn't matter. You can either accept that and trade the market for what it is, or you could be bitter and cynical and miss out on the move. So for now, this is looking pretty bullish to me. Consolidation at the highs. Again, any opportunity for a higher low. If this breaks down, fine. We're looking for a higher low at the top of the gap or the gap close. We're looking for a higher low on the retest of 175.70. I'm not really seeing a case to be made where XLK is suddenly going to be this big bearish force for the broad market. And I know this seems like, you know, a big, you know, change in tone, but it literally was the fastest sentiment change that I've ever seen in the market, maybe outside of the sickness low, fastest sentiment change ever. So there's your XLK. Let's take a look at the SMH, what's going on with semiconductors. Speaking of tech, same thing. There's your cup and handle breaking to a new all-time high. Zooming in, sure, you're getting a little bit of what looks like it could be distribution at these highs. There's your Wednesday upper wick rejecting uh, the high of the all-time high first and foremost, but the Monday high of day. If we start breaking down underneath the previous all-time high zone over here, I could easily see a gap close. But again, what are we thinking about? Higher lows are the name of the game on your daily or even weekly chart. Weekly higher lows are anywhere over this inflection point at 152.25. Again, the name of the game when it comes to sectors right now is just understanding the rotation. Uh, in terms of the XLY, a little bit more work to do over
over here. A strong recapture getting back into this as an overall range, but on a relative basis, you'd really prefer to see the XLY starting to trade over 175 to sustain more of a bullish stance for the broad market. So watching that quite closely, we do just have a balance range in here, a balance within a balance, if you will. So range rules in play does strike me as being more bullish than bearish with the failure to move into the gap from over here, right? We looked into the gap, did not find further sellers. Buyers responded, kept the consolidation. So if we can take out these highs more meaningfully at 169, that would be a help for the S&P and the broad market as a whole, right? If the rotation is going to remain healthy, if the S&P is going to break and continue higher, could be led by something like your XLY while the XLK is pulling back. If this moves over 169, I would watch that very closely this week. Here's the XLE energy sector last, but certainly not least, hanging out near these highs. We know it's a really lightweight sector. There's an ascending triangle. It would have to clear somewhere north of roughly, let's just call that 94 for now. Uh, if we take a closer look, there is a slight issue with energy, right? And the fact that this is not really playing nicely with the macro narrative of like, hey, global uh, resuscitation of strong economies, right? It's, it's, you would really like to see oil not moving so aggressively in the downward direction. I know this is energy, perhaps a proxy. We could just look directly at the CL, which is the crude oil futures, right? If we take a closer look, look at the rotation lower. So little, you know, counter trend move here, but the dominating trend is certainly in the downward direction. Here is a head and shoulders. Uh, there's an OPEC meeting on Wednesday, I believe this week, we'll take a look at the economic calendar in just a moment. And they're talking about potential supply cuts to sort of bolster the price of crude right now. And again, if we're thinking about global economies doing well, generally speaking, when economies are doing well, there's demand for crude. And that's certainly not the case as of right now. So we'll keep tabs on that. It's not a make or break for the broad market currently. It would really play more nicely if the mac macro data, excuse me, starts to deteriorate more aggressively. Here's the sector ratio grid. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner on how to set this one up. Overall, the ratio shows are showing us that we have mostly a risk on market right now, but we need the baton to be passed. Look at the XLK really neutralizing and going sideways over here. If the risk on rotation is going to stay alive, you need a breakout here from the XLF and you need some improvements out of your XLY. If those two things don't happen, I'd really start to think about deeper pullbacks from the weekly point of view and those discussion points we had for the S&P and the NASDAQ. Here's the XLV moving in the upward direction, but still far underneath a descending now 50 SMA, not really a concern from a risk off style uh, point of view. If we look at the XLP, same idea, still underneath a descending 50 SMA. XLU is a little bit more neutral, still technically underneath though, that descending 50 SMA. So we do not have risk off, but risk on really needs to pass that baton over to financials and what we see over here out of discretionary. Communications would also help in the upward direction. A small concern is that financials clearly moved in the upward direction, but relatively speaking, there really wasn't much outperformance. So thinking about that, and once again, being very open to the idea where if this doesn't break, okay, weekly pullbacks are likely incoming. Let's take a look at some specialized ratios and see what these have to show us. Uh, certainly hanging out near the highs on the XLK over the SHY. That is a risk on and bullish indication. Similar story over here out of the XLK over the XLU. So tech versus utilities still hanging out near those highs. Even a higher low pullback up against your 50 SMA does remain constructive and bullish for the broad market. Apples to apples. Let's take a look at the XLY over the XLP. Consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. Start to break this range in the upward direction, but I really want more confidence. I want higher lows. I want more price acceptance technically over the top of that range, which is just arbitrarily here from a ratio point of view at 238. If it does pull back, higher lows need to hold the midpoint of this range at minimum and move promptly back out of this range. Any just chop and consolidation through here, once again, I would start to put my thinking cap on and say, all right, maybe those more substantial weekly pullbacks over for your S&P and your NASDAQ. Let's jump on over to the dollar and see what dollar and gold have to tell us for this upcoming week. Here is the overall range. Of course, this break has now failed back into the range. We find ourselves at the midpoint. So any lower highs remain constructive and alleviate pressure for equities if we can remain underneath 105.65, the top of the previous range, and clearly just a back test of the breakdown point from over here. What does gold have to say about this? The gold contract is actually looking pretty darn good here as a long setup up and over the top of this round figure at 2000. If that can break in the upward direction, technically puts downward pressure on the dollar, which in turn puts upward pressure on equities. So this is a bullish relationship as of right now out of metals. If we take a look at the silver contract, this has actually already started to break its equivalent flat top right here. So if this is going to foreshadow a move out of gold, it certainly looks more bullish than bearish for our broad market. What about interest rates? Let's move on over to our TNX. 
What do we see over here? Certainly a breakdown through the support trend line underneath the neckline of your head and shoulders. Any price consolidation underneath 45, but above 43.33 is looking okay. Remember that an aggressive breakdown over here would really start to signal that something is wrong with the market. If the 10 year just starts collapsing aggressively, there's likely going to be some Fed interference. If we're over 45, I would start to keep an open mind to any sort of breaks up and over the top of this range at 46.60. So call it 4.66 in the uh, 10 year yield. If we take that out in the upward direction, I think you're game on back to 5%. And that would certainly shock the equities market down below. The whole premise of this rally, you can almost see, is inverse to interest rates. Obviously, you move higher here in equities as rates come off aggressively. If you take a look at the notes as well, if you look at the futures for the ZN, for example, this is looking like a bullish setup. So what this means is that interest rates will go down if this can break this flat top here around 108.3, right? If we can take that out, that would be helpful for equities down below, keeping a close eye on it. Let's have a look at the ZT now to see what the indications are from the uh, you know two year and what the Fed might do. And it's still indicating a pause. Just remember that we are technically in a downtrend over here. So pretty firm on pause odds. Let's take a look at the tracker tool now. Oh no, we've lost our 100% vote of confidence for a prolonged pause. And instead we're looking at 95.5%, 87.6%, 69.5%. Oh no, what are we going to do? It's not 100 anymore. Basically prolonged pause into the midpoint of 2024. Your first cut is going to be a mild one at 25 basis points, another 25 cut, and then a pause for a month. Remember that the pace of cuts really matters here. As long as we're not pricing in or forecasting an aggressive cut to the tune of 50, 75, 100 basis points, the Fed likely hasn't broken something and they are not trying to intervene. If we do start to see that, it will usually happen really rapidly. It's not just going to be like, oh, we can see this coming. It's going to be like a night and day difference. That would just kind of be the indication and the takeaway that mm, something went wrong. The Fed's going to step in and try to save the day, right, with an aggressive rate cut to stimulate economic activity. So far, though, if we take a look at the economic data that came out last week, it was a shortened holiday week, but look at the unemployment claims. I I guess nobody really wants to let go employees ahead of Thanksgiving, but unemployment claims beat the expectation. 226 was expected, 209 was the actual read. Prior was revised slightly higher by 2000 to 31 was the initial uh, sort of read on the previous week's announcement. In terms of the manufacturing and services PMIs, they're basically flat. So you're not getting aggressive inflation, but we want to make sure we don't slip into deflationary uh, sort of zones, if you will. Uh, north of 50 is a good number. So manufacturing PMI really want to bolster themselves a little bit here and get back up and over that 50 number. Uh, but currently, not enough of a drawdown to really look into it and say, hey, recession's around the corner, right? It's just simply not the case based on the data set that we have in hand. If we look forward to the coming week's worth of trade, what do we see? Uh, home price index here, consumer confidence might be interesting on Tuesday morning. But really, as we know, OPEC on the Thursday session, I was off by a day, it seems. It's the PCE. Core PCE on Thursday is the next big deal for inflation, as long as that remains in check, I think that the Fed will really focus on the labor market aspect of their dual mandate and preventing uh, mass unemployment, people not being able to spend, so on and so forth. So as long as these unemployment claims continue to come in under 250,000, it's really not much of an issue that would suggest a spiral out of control from an unemployment uh, point of view, which as we know, is one of the first things that would indicate a looming recession. So watching that very closely on Thursday morning, 8.30, it will be a big time. And then on Friday, 11, December 1st, Jay Powell hops on the mic. He's got a little something for us. We will be uh, you know, tuning in to see how that unfolds for PCE every day this week, obviously. We will be live up in the penthouse, but donuts and coffee on me Thursday morning. Let's jump on over to the earnings calendar. Obviously, we had NVIDIA earnings last Tuesday. Everything kind of went fine with that. No major gap. The chart is okay. Uh, we'll get to it in just a moment. But for some honorable mentions here, we've definitely got CrowdStrike worth watching, Splunk as well, some cloud computing stuff, Hewlett Packard. Uh, and then if we take a look over here, Dollar Tree will be interesting from a consumer spending perspective. Is the Dollar Tree still seeing uh, any, anything going on with the consumer? Snowflake, Salesforce. Um, and then what do we have over here? Marvel from a chip making perspective and Dell the Dinosaur from a computing perspective. So an interesting interesting week, but all the big boys, all the heavy hitters are really out of the way currently. Let's take a look now at some risk appetite. So the TLT ratio to the S&P is still underneath a resistance trend line here, but the ratio is starting to flatten out just a little bit. I want to make note that if we break the resistance trend line sideways through time, that is not a classic flight to safety style mechanism. You really need to break this by price action aggressively moving in the upward direction. There's no indication of that currently. This really plays nicely if we take a look at bonds in relationship to one another. There's 
becoming more confidence in longer duration assets, right? If we take a look at these downtrends that are budding, they're early stages, right? Let's not get it twisted. There's still an opportunity for like a monthly high or low up here. But for the most part, if these trends can continue in the downward direction, it would speak to confidence in risk assets such as growth stocks, right? Really, that's your longest duration risk on style play. So shorter term, like, hey, let's flight to safety over to short term bonds. It's becoming unwound just a little bit. This also plays nicely with the whole idea of credit spreads uh, really tightening back up, right? This was your widening. We were like, okay, seems as though we're going through some tumultuous times. I mean, look at the new lower low that was produced out of your medium time frame, IEF LQD. Shorter time frame, SHY HYG, it's moving in the right direction, but still not underneath the lows from back over here. I would just say that the unwinding of this move is certainly feeling better for risk on and risk appetite for equities down below. Let's take a look at the HYG in isolation. This is playing nicely. It's moving in lockstep. There was a little bit of a divergence between here and here intra-week, right? And now these things have broken in the same direction and the HYG is playing nicely with the equities market down below. So no issues from a divergence perspective there. Does seem like a risk, uh, definitely a risk on indication for the market. Let's go ahead and take a look at Bitcoin. What's going on with the digital gold? Putting in a bull flag up here once again. This is a risk on and bullish indication. And now let's move on over to some market breadth. New highs versus lows did make another consecutive week of positive impressions here moving in the upward direction. It's a good first step. Remember that for a market recovery, we don't need these gangbuster reads around 500. We just need to stay positive. And so far, that's what it's trying to do over here. The more time we spend over the zero line, the better for a constructive look in the upward direction. What about the SPX A200R? Uh, this is making a substantial stride over the 50% mark. We saw an uptick this past week. This moved in sync in the upward direction. That is a bullish indication. Same thing with your SPX A50R moving higher into the end of the week, even as we really just consolidated sideways up here. Notice the big uptick on the Friday session that does strike me as a bullish indication, speaking to the broadening nature of the market rally. Let's move on over to the RSP. What's going on with the equal weight S&P? Again, speaking to the broadening nature, I do like the recovery of 145.75. It was the neckline retest of this from a head and shoulders point of view. And the fact that we didn't really struggle there does strike me as a bullish indication. Now, again, it's totally reasonable for a higher low pullback to unfold here. As long as we can maintain some sort of higher low over 142, I would make the argument that the RSP is trying to be constructive over the neckline of the inverted head and shoulders, right? It's almost the exact same thing as what we had discussed over in the IWM small cap. So watching that very closely here, uh, it would be sort of irresponsible to, yes, not point out that we are technically sitting in a major divergence from this point of view here to here versus here to here. So understand that, but it's trying to make steps in the right direction, giving it the benefit of the doubt as long as the trends can remain in sync in the upward direction. Next up, let's take a look at the QQQE over the NDX. So equal weight, S, uh, excuse me, NASDAQ. Um, clearly same sort of concept from here to here, but for the most part, recapturing the midpoint of the overall range. It's constructive as long as higher lows remain above the bottom of the range at 74.45. Let's take a look at the Dow industrials versus the transports. And what you'll see over here is again, big divergence on the grander scheme of things. This, it's just not even close, right? Not even close. The other thing to point out is that we've clearly broken up and over this prior pivot top from here. If you do the same thing over in transports, they're saying, whoa, 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 hold your horses. We are not ready to uh, rock and roll in the upward direction. So it's not, again, these divergences in the equal weight sort of market breadth uh, indications that we look at, they're not outright bearish indications. This alone is not enough evidence to go out there and short the broad market and say, oh, it's got, it's, you know, it's got to go to zero. These things are too divergent. It's not how it works, but it might keep you a little bit skeptical of playing for outright continuation and big breaks to new higher highs in things like your NASDAQ, things like your S&P. They keep you skeptical, but they certainly should not be enough to make you bearish. Let's move along and take a look at some volatility indications. Uh, remember, price always rules all. Whatever the S&P is doing, really, that rules all. And then we use this as supporting evidence. New lows out of the VIX, new lowest low that we've seen in a very long time. Wouldn't be unreasonable for a small uptick here uh, to inject a little bit of volatility to this market. Uh, again, is it going to be enough to kick off a massive route, a big breakdown that's you know giving back more than the 38.2 FIB on the weekly perspective? I would tend to think not. And I would sort of confirm that with a look at the VIX, just saying, sure, we're getting closer to complacency zone around that 75 handle. So anything that sort of sees a minor uptick might kick off a little bit of volatility, but nothing that would suggest, okay, look out below, we're over 103. And the same thing with our volatility futures, what you'll notice is a very deep contango over here, nowhere even remotely close to the zero line. That's comfortable for, you know, sort of allocating risk to the market from a money manager perspective. Same thing with the nine versus 30 day VIX and your one day VIX as well continues to reject and stay underneath the overhead balance from when we really saw the downturn 
return through late September and early October. If you've made it to this point in the video, I appreciate you coming out to the show. I truly do hope you had a great, fantastic holiday with friends and families. Let's kick off the core list of companies with Apple. You can see your excess high produced on the Wednesday session, Thursday holiday, Friday half day starts to break down. So if this is going to produce a pullback, this is looking pretty good up here uh, for the beginning stages of that. Notice the break of the 192, no price acceptance in that upper wick, and we're already starting to break down through this midpoint of the overall range. The better short is looking for a breakdown of 188 to undo some of this thin structure. You're looking at targets 185, 183, 75 to the downside. Any consolidation up here really just turns this into a weekly or even daily bull flag. So I wouldn't fight it, which is why, again, we're talking about 188 breakdowns to really kick off a downtrend here. Uh, but consolidation that then breaks into the future over 192, probably looking for hourly higher lows there to be a little bit more confident. You're looking for a retrace of this thin structure breakdown into 195 as a target. Then we can walk them up. 196.75, an all time high, is your contender after that. Here it is on the hourly time frame chart just to show that lack of acceptance in the upper wick over the 192. All the price acceptance is underneath. So precursor for the downtrend is price acceptance down here. This is now overhead supply, overhead supply, breakdown through 188. That's your downtrend. Anything that's up here breaks with higher lows over 192. As we just discussed, you can aim for those upper targets. Let's jump back over to a daily. Take a look at Microsoft, new all-time highs inbound, basically. Consolidating up at the highs, the whole uh, open AI drama, all for nothing, right? The chart barely has moved here. Inside bar on Friday, little consolidation doji on the Wednesday session as well, ticking to a new all-time high. So very, very straightforward. Break over 379, higher lows on the hourly. You know, intraday levels that form, blue sky territories, whole and half dollars, you're good to go. Stronger breakdowns, I really wouldn't look to get involved uh, in Microsoft's stronger downside until we can actually take out this level down here. I know it seems like it's eons and eons away, but your prior all-time high at 364.25 really kicks off the, you know, or it opens the door, I should say, through the thin structure retracement back here. So your better shorts are really underneath that level. Level. Here it is on the hourly time frame chart. You can just see the wild back and forth up here. Here's your healthy consolidation looking for that break. If you're down here, maybe you could be open to the idea of a scalp in the downward direction underneath 371, but I really wouldn't push it on the daily chart until you can actually break down underneath that prior all time high once again to kick off the stronger retracement of this thin structure move. Let's jump on over to Google back to a daily time frame chart. Taking a look over here, uh, equal highs being produced. Um, again, higher high on Wednesday, Friday, a little bit of a pullback. Is it the end of the world? No, certainly in an uptrend here, lows, higher lows, higher lows, still possible to find higher lows around 136. You pretty much want to see this be it for the pullback and remain inside of this range and push back out of it. If we do start to break down through it on the hourly, what you'll notice is we have thin structure to retrace, right? So this is a very nuanced level at that 136. So in here, yeah, I'll give the bears the benefit of the doubt, bear flag consolidation. If we break thin structure to retrace, if we hold it and push back out, you've got to be bullish based on the daily trend that we really just walked through. Your better downside indications if there's firmly going to be a trend change wants to be a lower high back within this range and then a breakdown through the lows here and a loss of your daily 50 SMA kicks off a stronger move lower. That's really more so of a daily trend reversal with a weekly lower high. So one step at a time there, but so far giving it the benefit of the doubt here over that 136. Next up, Amazon. What's going on with the no longer mini beast? Last but not least, uh, flat top clean, clean breakout level into the early stages of this week, watching 147 like a hawk. This will be a top watch into the Monday session. If we can take it out, 150 becomes a target. Any continuation above that, 153.25 is your next overhead level. If we're just consolidating in here, the pattern lives on. Technically, you're getting something that looks like this, ascending triangle. If we do start to spend more time underneath 143.30, I'd be open to the idea that this could become a distribution pattern and a breakdown under 140.50 opens the door for a deeper pullback. Something here would make a lot of sense on the weekly to 134 and a retest of your daily 200 or excuse me 50 SMA there in blue. Let's move along and take a look at Nvidia. Nvidia earnings, the big disappointment, right? It really didn't do anything here. Uh, not much price action going on. If you were an option buyer, you pretty much got screwed on that move, especially if you were trading Friday's expiration. A little bit of a pullback unfolding after making a new all-time high. We are spending some time on Friday underneath that uh, 482 level. So if we continue to spend time there, obviously thin structure, right? This entire way, um, you can start to look at these as downside levels, but really, I mean, here it is on the hourly. There's really not much structure in there. 
right? The strongest level I would, I would likely recommend is 450 with your daily 50 SMA. Anything deeper than that, it's really the retest of this as something like a weekly double bottom neckline, daily double bottom neckline closer to 438, 437. 437 would be that level. But for now, treating it for what it is, this is possibly a distribution with your lower high here underneath that neckline, 482. You know the name of the game, looking for some breakdowns to continue. Next up, Metaverse. What's going on with Zuckerberg's Fantasyland? How's the ACL healing up? Eh, it looks like it's going all right. You'll notice that we have a flat top, very similar to Amazon. So breaking out over 342, looking for continuation higher into 347.50. Next target would be 350.325. If we do break down, any higher lows that remain over 329, good to go here on the daily time frame chart. If we start to dip a toe underneath 329, now you're starting to think, okay, right, this kind of unfolds. You get your head and shoulders. There's your daily trend reversal. So first and foremost, pullbacks here on the first test, looking for buyers to show up. If we produce a lower high and reattempt it, that's where it gets a little bit more dangerous for that breakdown. You can walk down your targets. 324 and 317 is a big line in the sand. We know that 317 uh, keeps us out of trouble from this incredibly, incredibly choppy range from in the past. Next up, Tesla. What's going on with Mr. Musk? We've got a balance range here. Treat it at face value. Call it for what it is. There is your range. If you take out the top over 246.25, looking for continuation up towards the highs from back here at 256.25. If we move in the downward direction, looking for a retest of this level here. Remember that as we tried to fill this gap, on the lower wick of that bar, it was promptly bought right back up. So as of right now, based on Friday's indication, let's go down to the hourly actually. What you'll notice is that it was bull flag, a break. So notice that we broke to a higher high in that upper wick. It did not find any follow through, right? And of course, it's the opposite now. So bear flag down here, starting to produce a lower high underneath uh, or near, I should say, your daily 50 SMA, the blue line, or that structural element at 236.75. Continued consolidation. You're looking for a flush point underneath 236.65 to once again attempt this area here. The full gap close is 224. This is fairly straightforward out of Tesla. Range until proven otherwise. Last but certainly not least, we have Netflix. We have an overhead gap. Again, thank you for the reminder. Uh, this has been a fairly straightforward chart, but it's starting to push its luck a little bit. This is maybe me applying human emotion and human logic to the market, which tends to not go well, but it's been fairly straightforward, right? Three bar play in the upward direction breaks out. Three bar play or consolidation in the upward direction breaks out. Three bar play in the upward direction breaks out. So with this consolidation near the highs, I'm tempted to say, all right, it seems as though we can only continue this for so long. Let's be a little bit cautious here with the inverted hammer that's printed, the rejection looking into that overhead gap. If we were to take this out to the downside, we might kick off a stronger pullback. So watching very closely, 476.50, if we take it out, looking for a retest of your last breakout point, and you can just continue to walk these things down like stair steps. The next major one to really be focused on is right around in here at 447.50, and your daily line in the sand is at 437. Remember that this was technically like bull pennant, bull flag consolidation. It has led to a massive breakout. As long as you can hold that for like a weekly higher low, I would remain constructive on Netflix to maybe attempt the gap close overhead from from a previous, 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 previous earnings cycle over 481.75 closes to 506.60. Two trade ideas, and then you are on your way. eBay is up first. E-B-A-Y is the ticker spelled exactly like the company. You can see a three-bar play in the upward direction, very reminiscent of what we were just looking at over on Netflix, but I like the fact that this is broken from a balance range in the upward direction. Beautiful consolidation on that Friday session. So again, it's a Friday session, incredibly light volume, half-day session, so it might not be the strongest indication in the world, but nonetheless, if we can get follow-through up and over that daily 50 SMA, your target's up here at 42.6. Probably looking for yeah, maybe a scalp with shares here. I'm not too confident in the options market over on eBay, but a scalp nonetheless is available up and over that 41.85. Ideally, you just want to see it hold 41.25, the low of Friday, but more importantly, confluence with the high of this inverted hammer from back over here. Last but certainly not least, CSCO, Cisco Systems. What's going on with the systems? You can see not only Friday as a consolidation day, but this entire thing post earnings, it really got beat up on earnings, big gap down right? But a flat top and then a big gap to close overhead, a very attractive setup. If I do say so myself, uh, you can get some sort of trend line like this. Nonetheless, breaking over 48.35 into the gap. I mean, the risk reward here is absolutely massive. Swing traders could look for something that sets up like this. Day trade scalpers can just look to trade this in the upward direction, taking advantage of upside momentum and the lack of overhead structure. As long as this can maintain the opening print from the earnings gap down at 47.40, any consolidation in here really goes. Ideally, it holds the trend line, but 
but willing to give it the benefit of the doubt if it can hold over that opening print. That's all I've got for you on today's session of the weekly watch list. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything new, let me know down below in the comment section or by giving the video a very simple thumbs up. We will be live in the penthouse at 8.15 come Monday morning to get right back in the driver's seat, get to work, and kick off a brand new week of trading for our pre-market prep. With that said, I wish you a green trading week.